For our next session, we'll be looking at data storage, curation and preservation. And we've got five questions that have been identified that we need to ask now. Um, you've got them in your programme if you want to have a look. We're going to try our best to cover all five and to discuss them. We've got three people who surely really don't need any introduction. From the USA, we're joined by Dr. Vince Cerf, Chief Internet Evangelist and Vice President of Google. Hello, hi there. We Hello again also to Professor Neil Lawrence, DeepMind Professor of Machine Learning at the University of Cambridge. Hello. And also from the UK, uh, welcome to Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt, Principal of Jesus College. Oxford and chairman and co-founder of the Open Data Institute. Hello to you. Now thank you very much all three of you for joining us today. I think probably it's best to just dive straight in with these five questions that have been identified. The first one is how should we be managing digital accessibility of data in the long term and what about legacy systems? Who would like to start on this one? Ah, Vince, Vince got his hand up. Go ahead. Oh, it's well, it's Vince, and, and uh, Neil and Nigel are kind enough to let me jump in here. I've been preaching something called the digital dark age for quite a while. Here's my big worry. Uh, a lot of digital information is formatted and stored in media that uh, don't last long. And so if you don't copy the things into new media that are so the, the data is still readable, you may lose it. The bits just go away. Or worse, uh, the bits are still there, but there's nothing that can read them because the equipment that knows how to read and interconnect, interconnect with the medium may no longer be operating so that we have the physical problem. But we also have a logical problem because a lot of data has format and the format requires software in order to make the data readable and displayable or or even to interact with like as a spreadsheet. And so since operating systems and hardware change over time, the software that is needed in order to correctly interpret older media may no longer run on the new operating systems or the new hardware, in which case we now have a legacy problem. Uh, and how do we maintain the ability to correctly run old software in order to interpret old data? And the last point I would make about the World Wide Web in particular is that Although it gives you the feeling that it, everything is there all the time, every time you look, it's still there, and so one day it isn't. Everybody has experienced 404, page not found. There is no guarantee in the World Wide Web that everyone will save everything that's ever been put up there. So if you want to save it, then you have to do something uh, active, and that's what the Internet Archive, for example, is trying to do. But it faces all the problems I was just referring to uh, as to uh, data that's accessible. So I'm, I don't want to overstay my time, but that's, that would be my introduction to the answer to question number one, which is a very important problem. Okay, so it's very important. Uh, Nigel, over to you. Uh, how important is it and what is the way forward on it? Any thoughts? Well, we have a helicopter taking off in the background, so if you can <laughs> believe it or not, we've just had a uh, and senior here at Oxford with honorary degrees handed out to the great and the good. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, listen, um, I think it's a crucial, this idea of deep time and preservation, pretty important. Um, it's not just about the longer term though. I mean, I was reading, um, and you can take these statistics with a pinch of salt, but IDC had a view that we have about six zettabytes of installed memory in 2020. And that's about 2% of what was generated in 2020. So there's a question of, uh, I mean, a lot of that is just the traffic we're generating right now. I mean, there are lots of ways of sizing this that can get to incredible numbers. But I mean, there's clearly quite an interesting question about what is already drifting off into the ether and isn't being persistently stored. Uh, so it's ephemeral. I, I am obviously an advocate for open standards in this regard. You know, persistent open standards, the flash player phenomena is not a place we want to go. I mean, already you can't see some oh, of the... Yeah. 9-11 material you know it's uh, uh it's had to be reconstructed at, at, at some cost and not all of it has been so and, and i just do think that and don't forget that data uh, programs are a form of data and uh the need to preserve them in a form that is enduring and, and vince is quite right about the challenge i think that the development of open repositories of repos like github and open standards therein helps uh but I think we've got to be quite mindful of the investment it might take to really sustain this and to be mindful about what we decide to collect and curate. And we can't necessarily know right now 
what will really be of interest in the future. Thank you. Um, Neil, what's your take on this? There's not probably not a lot more to add to what Vint and Nigel have said. They, they've put it very beautifully. And my own experience is that a lot of early machine learning conferences were on web pages only. And those pages, they're on the Internet archives, but the vital PDF files associated with the conferences aren't cached. So the, the bit that you're interested in is missing. And I've just gone through the process of reconstructing five different conferences um, from from paper proceedings, <laughs> which is oh, ironic. Um, uh, now, I, the, but having said that, there's another important aspect that is um, there are certain data that we probably don't want to preserve. And this is making things even harder. So, you know, it's right to be forgotten, for example, is, is an aspect of it. If you look at the data that people are leaving on the internet now, social media data, et cetera, things that people are doing when they're young, that the normal process of forgetting would, would mean that an employer wouldn't see this because it's none of their business, is now there for the entire record. So it's got that much more complicated because each of these different types of data, some of it we probably would say, well, actually, that, that could just degrade. And other of it is like, no, that mustn't degrade. And, and we haven't labeled it up. I think so, so this is a perfect uh, example. The, the internet remembers things that you wish it didn't, and it forgets things that you wish it didn't. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a frustrating uh, environment, I'm afraid. We, we've talked about... I think it calls um, for, 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 for serious knowledge management and governance procedures. That's what it, it, people need to be mindful about this from the outset. And, and who is it who makes the decision about what is kept? and what we don't worry about if it disappears in the same way that Neil has described something, stuff has disappeared. Who are the people who make those decisions? I think that that's one of the big problems is that there's a divide between the technical capability to do that type of provision and the sort of people that, that we, you would want in power to, to make those decisions. So at the moment, just de facto, it ends up being larger organizations that will have particular perspectives, often not their fault, trying to do the best thing. Because a lot of people who you'd like to think about that and make that decision, the data is not in their hands. It's being managed on their behalf by other entities. And they have a very indirect say in that. And, and that, for me, is a major problem. And, and how you create institutions that can help with that is, is a major question. So it, just to jump in for a second, there are a set of parameters here. There are intellectual property concerns associated associated with preserving and executing software, for example. So that's one problem. The second one is that even if there are tools around for preserving things, there's cost associated with that. So you have to have a business model that makes sense. Libraries are in the business sometimes of deaccessioning content in order to make, up, make space for new stuff, for instance. Uh, and in, in many cases, um, we would like people who wanted to save something to have the ability to do it, technically. Uh, but then there are these other parameters that uh, that come into play, including cost. Yeah, we we might touch on this later. But the, the, the notion that has been developed is the concept of of data institutions of various sorts, whose mandate is partly to act as custodians over the long term, in the spirit of libraries and universities and, and learner societies. But I mean, you know, uh, really building that in and. Uh, uh, particularly in in various corporate sectors where, uh, you know, what is the average uh, uh, corporate lifespan and are we confident that these things will endure into the future and that the bits that need to be maintained and curated will be. Uh, that's that's going to be, that may require us to develop as much new institutional architectures as technical architectures or use some old ones that are there to help. Thank well, you very much. I'm, I'm, 2,000 years old. I feel we've got to move on. We've got we've we've done quite a bit about question one. We could always come back later if we have the time. Let's look now at, at, at question two. How can we ensure traceability and how much does it matter? Uh, who'd like to start us off on that one? Where the data has come from? No, I, I just open with the same point. Can... Neil, go on. So I just go from with the same point that um the traceability is going to vary depending on what the data you're interested in. And to use an example where traceability sort of come up is if you look at cryptocurrencies, people have this, oh, there's anonymous transactions, but you can trace the process of the money. So you get this new weird thing that you can see if a piece of money was used in a transaction that you later find out to be illegal. It's 100% traceable, but you can't see who did the transaction itself. 
And so it's a sort of question, like, where do you want the traceability to be is going to vary according to circumstance. And it's like a more complicated version of the previous question, like which data do you want to keep and which data do you want to lose? So if we're talking about traceability around, I don't know, data about a bridge, the sort of data centric engineering thing, it's very important to know what the origin of the data is, what the quality of that data is, if you're doing sort of downstream processing, and that's a certain type of traceability, but it's quite different from the sort of distributed traceability advocates of blockchain might be looking for, or you're in smart contracts. And, and I think it's even arguable in some of those smart contracts that you, you don't want that trace type of traceability for precisely the forgetting reasons I mentioned before. Yeah, that's a great point. I, uh, however, if we come back to some of the core uh, scientific data we care about, we, we've been going through the pandemic and, and people have been kind of asking themselves, why does it turn out to be quite so hard to get reliable data and data that you want and why we had to repurpose stuff we hadn't even thought that we might uh, need uh, to use in a different context? I mean, uh, for a long time now, science has been trying to sign up to these fair principles, you know, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, which are great things, but it's still quite amazing just how little widespread attention there is to the serious underpinning data engineering. It's boring and tedious and vitally important, but uh, uh, often the last thing on people's kind of uh, to-do list. So we, I think, and, and... There for a moment, or is he just we having lost Nigel, a thought? But I think I could I just back up what he's saying. It's, it's also in the AI um, strategy aspects of this, because I know I was instrumental in trying to make sure we talked a bit about that, because that data engineering, I think he's just referring to is, um, Absolutely critical. As he said, it's it's the sort of plumbing. I always think of it's like the sewer systems of the data ecosystem. Everyone wants flush toilets. No one wants to dig out the sewers that make the flush toilets work. And that, that's exactly where we are with our data systems. And everyone's writing up the marvels that their flush toilet does. But what happens is you plumb it in and it's just dumping stuff directly out to the street. It's, it's, it's a really shocking situation. And, and as Nigel said, we really found that out, that the pandemic really showed that off. So uh, I think there's another element uh, to look into um, that Neil is, is raising. It has to do with the provenance of the information to say nothing of metadata associated with data. Uh, and it's very important to be able to capture all of the context in which data was, was uh, generated because later you, know, you may need that information in order to correctly evaluate it. And there have been many instances where uh, data from earlier scientific experiments has been reinterpreted and reanalyzed based in the light of new theories and has uh, taught us new lessons. And so uh, we don't want to lose things that could teach us something in the future. But we do need to know where did this stuff come from and under what circumstances and conditions and how well was it maintained, uh, all of which uh, takes up space and cost and effort. Uh, so um, once again, I have an example. The National Science Foundation insists that all of the proposals that come in have a data management and preservation plan. And so they all have a plan, but whether they execute on the plan is a different story. <laughs> yes, it's all very well having and, and plans, but it's, it's to what extent we follow them. Uh, so are we yeah, ready? So I think checking to... whether they executed is extremely hard. That's a, that's a real challenge to actually to do the checks. The effort to check that someone has carried out the plan they said they were going to have is is as, almost as hard as doing the plan itself. Yeah. 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 But is it a bit like seatbelts? Once everybody accepts you do put your seatbelt on when, when you start traveling, it just becomes the normal thing to do. But at the moment, it isn't yet the normal thing to do. At the moment, we're still joyriding and loving driving the car. We're not, we're not yet thinking about those other aspects. Well, it, just to use your point for a moment, uh, usually those kinds of things, seatbelts and smoking, for example, uh, come along with certain in inducements uh, to, uh, to follow good practice. For example, if you're caught driving without a seatbelt, there are consequences. If you're caught smoking somewhere uh, where you're not supposed to, there are consequences. We don't yet have a set of formalized uh, or even norms associated with data preservation. And I think we still have work to do to create incentives for that, as well as assuring that there are technical capabilities and uh, cost uh, coverage in order to make this actually work. 
And I think that the, the, the analogy extends. I mean, it's, um, it's unfortunately not as easy as the seatbelts thing. And it's much closer to like when cities built sewage systems, it took like the stench and a massive cholera epidemic that, uh, you know, meant that the parliament had to leave London because the Thames smelled so bad that, um, you know, before Bazalgette put in the London sewers. And, you know, of course, Bazalgette's a great hero, but we still don't hear about the sewer operators today until they get plugged up with these fatbergs or whatever else, and we don't put enough investment in them. And it's the same type of issue. Infrastructure is something that is being increasingly neglected overall. Um, and it's, it's so it's sometimes difficult to imagine what is the process by which Victorian were able to get together and say, hey, we need water, we need fresh water, because it was uh, water corporations, when you look at how they built that infrastructure, it was business people getting together saying, we need to solve this because it's bad for us all when it's not solved. So I, I think it, it's much more complicated than the sort of seatbelt smoking, as, as, as Vint implied, and, and needs actual deeper understanding of the problem within policy and within politics um, to get action on it. And let's hope we don't end up with so the equivalent the, the of the cholera outbreak. Up. Vint, go on. Uh, yeah, the Thames, I think it's got salmon in it now, Vin. I think you can go fishing in it. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, we've moved on to the quality of the Thames. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like, it was, I think this is 1850s Basil Jet, something like that. Don't quote me. But, it, but today, it's actually much, much cleaner. I'm going to pull you back. I'm going to pull you back uh, because I, I see that unfortunately we've lost Nigel from the conversation. I'm hoping he's going to come back in. But I still feel we now need to move on to uh, another question, which is how can we exploit data for greater impact, and what role can digital twins play? So exploiting data and the value of digital twins. Who'd like to start us on that? Vint. Uh, just one comment. First, they, we're, people are already exploiting data and some people think that that's bad. And so if the purposes for which the exploit is undertaken uh, needs uh, some examination. So we should be thoughtful about that. With regard to digital twins, they can be really powerful. This is sort of models of the way your company works or models of the way the city is functioning. What's important is the integrity of that model and the ability to uh, make predictions about what happens when things change. So a natural disaster, for example, uh, and we've lost power, what can we do? What's the most immediate, uh, uh, most effective uh, tactic we should take? What about rerouting traffic, things like that? So I'm a big fan of digital twins, but you have to validate their uh, accuracy before you can rely on them. Thank you. And I, I like what to, do you feel about the word um, yeah, it's a dangerous word, exploit. Um, it, it, of course, it depends on the context um, that you're using it. I think, uh, you know, um, the, the challenge is, is exploitation when the people who are gaining the benefit are different um, from the people from whom the data originated. And that's the circumstance that we have at the moment. And that goes back to the data institutions point that Nigel was talking about when, so if you have these data institutions, then the hope is that they, they can try and rectify that because data often originates from individuals, but the value in data comes when it's aggregated. So mm -hmm. in terms of exploitation, that value is, is occurring with those who've aggregated and that happens today to be larger companies. I sometimes say, well, it's somewhat akin to the feudal society where uh, you sort of you had sort of people who worked on the land and they had a duty of fealty to the Lord and the Lord had a duty of care over them. But they, there's a power asymmetry there. So, so that, that's a problem. And I think that that is, is, is one problem among many. But, but just to add a couple of other problems in there, there's a, a value propagation problem that is associated with the infrastructure point that we were making before. So that um, it, it's difficult to know, like the data why do, the work I do cleaning data up so that it makes it available for other people to use, it's difficult to trace that back. And our system of IP around copyright for that doesn't incentivize at the moment people to make that data available as freely as they can. And often it's joining different data sets from different companies yeah. that, that would enable yeah. that to happen. And so there's a sort of legal technical problem in there. And there's, that's a real issue, sticky issue, because whenever you see legal technical problems, you look back historically, like the sort of cars going on the road, you need this co-evolution of law and technology. And I think that one of the things I'm very interested in is how do you accelerate that process of co-evolution of understanding, developing the law, checking whether it's working, matching the technology and, and that's a really big problem but i'll stop there because i see nigel's back and so 
Yeah, Maybe uh, sorry, question. my apologies for kind of uh, dropping off the end of the medieval world that is Oxford. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the time here. And uh, if we uh, now move on to question four, which co covers some of the same kind of issues. How can we manage data hazards, including human error? So these are the things that could go wrong. Uh, who'd like to start on this one? How do we manage data hazards, including human error? Well, Nigel? let me just speak to some work that the, uh, yeah, the, the Open Data has been, Institute has been working on a whole program of work around what we call data assurance. And, and, and this is essentially um, to come back to the notion of having a managed set of steps in which we understand both the life cycle, the natural history of data and its various uh, uh, involvements and originations with, with, with humans. Now, data assurance is going to end up a little bit like other forms of assurance in insurance. We're going to want to have, it'll be too valuable, this, these assets to kind of leave to happen chance uh, in many cases. And so the, the market for warranting and certifying the quality of data assets will, I think, become quite significant in some key areas. Um, alongside that, we, of course, are aware that issues around the fundamental security attributes of our of our data hazards we've touched on some of them around um can we be assured that the data itself has been is is true is 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 not been tampered with um there are challenges in modern machine learning around guaranteeing um uh, performance of an algorithm when distribution shift happens when the data on which uh, uh, a system was trained when you put it into the field there can be all sorts of impacts on the the new context lots of research on this but the hazards around the assurance you have that you can trust the data in new and different contexts is essential and finally the issue of course is is human susceptibilities around all of this you know the extent to which our own uh, cognitive uh, facilities and uh, uh, biases can often mean that the way we come to interpret and integrate the data that's actually being presented really effectively by our algorithms is is misrepresented so there is a huge landscape that needs to be managed around what we think of as a new class of fundamental activity data assurance thank you uh, any other comments about eight. data hazards including the issue of human error neil i just build on that briefly with an analogy, which is we do have one set of data for which we've solved a lot of these problems, and it's called financial data. Mm -hmm. And we have an enormous profession that spends all its time trying to solve these problems on our behalf because money is data that is money. So people put a lot of effort into its curation and assurance and stopping errors. And if you go to any company, I'd even hazard to guess Google, Vin. Who's more important, the CFO or the, I don't know, anyone else on the board? It's the CFO. I mean, certainly in any other company, maybe Google, the CIO or the equivalent is as important. But the CIO is always going to be less important than the CFO. Um, and when you look at the size of their department and the number of people you've got tracing the data associated with financial information in the company, you have an idea of how big the challenge would be if we chose to apply that level of assurance across all data sets. I, I have to, to tell you, Neil, that you might be wrong in the case of Google, because if we don't have a good information infrastructure, we don't need a CFO because <laughs> nothing works and we don't make any money. Yeah. So Google, the one exception, might maybe, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, looking at the time, but deep fakes. Uh, I mean, the issue of being assured that the data um, that you that you're seeing is uh, <laughs> what it claims to be that is going to be a really deep, persistent challenge. And and of course, again, that relates to, 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 to Neil's point in in financial uh, uh, services, the ability to interrogate a set of accounts increasingly automatically to see whether there is something untoward in there turns out to be pretty important. Yeah. Well, the credit card companies are demonstrating uh, the use of machine learning in order to detect uh, the occurrence of unusual transactions mm -hmm. in order to warn people that somebody may have uh, taken over their uh, credit card accounts. So those are examples of ways in which we are trying to expose problems of this kind. We only have three and a half minutes left. So the last question was, what new paradigms are emerging with new data sources and types? 
this is, you know, who's, the prediction of the future, the blue skies, where are we going? Anybody want to offer something up on that? Well, I, one thing I will say, Internet of Things implies all kinds of programmable devices that are on the net and they're generating enormous amounts of data. They're accepting commands and controls. They're responding and doing things. Uh, and so that's a whole space of newly generated content uh, that we are now going to have to cope with at scale and also with regard to what happens when it doesn't work right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and we've seen, again, we've seen in the pandemic, I think, uh, examples where um, um, we really could have done with some data preposition that we actually turned out to really need. Um, and one of the most striking examples is the so-called contact matrix. It's, you know, how many people and what sort of people do I meet on a daily basis? And it was extraordinary how imperfect that information was, given the amount of information we collect that's directly or indirectly related to that you might think in our social and digital interactions. So there, there's a whole bunch of um, areas where we need to think about uh, the data assets we need going forward. You can't anticipate everything, but I think there's a great deal to do with just regimenting and anticipating uh, how data can, so-called happenstance data, how it can be repurposed effectively and uh, again that we're back to issues of data uh, standards to make that process feasible neil what sorts of you got you were exposed to 200 people on the tour. I, I i don't have much to add to what vin and uh, nigel said i think it's been a really uh, interesting discussion and, and as nigel knows i'm very that happenstance data issue in particular is um i think that overall we've got this problem that data is this amorphous thing and we use this one word for i mean data is everything everything has data associated with it and when we have a conversation about this around data imagine having a half hour conversation about life or something like that and all the different aspects and how we should treat them um it, it's just impossible but it, the real effort is to get deeper public understanding of the data and how it's being used so that they can have their voices heard because just as we want their input in in how their lives are led and how we govern countries and cities and whatever else to, to make them happy. The same complexity is there with the data, which is a reflector. It's a virtualization of their lives as much as anything else. I, I was going to ask you I something. I think that Neil has just put his finger on uh, My question I'm for sorry, Neil is, quiet, uh, we haven't saying. talked that much about machine learning, about AI, about data that's been created not from sensors on a building um, or, or tracking buses. This, this is data that's been uh, created through AI. Is that an area that we, we really need to be thinking about where that's come from and what we do with it? Yeah, I think so. I guess I just, it's it back to the flush toilets analogy. You know, everyone wants to talk about their flush toilet, which is the AI and the ML. And but, but the, none of it's working without the sewage system. In fact, we're making things worse when we start using these techniques in a, in a world without sort of infrastructures. So I'm a professor of machine learning, I've spent my life developing it, and I just think, oh my goodness, we really need to sort the data now. Um, and I think the pandemic has shown that more than anything else. Vin, could, would you like to have a last word here? Again. We are over dependent on high tech right now, and it is not necessarily as stable as we would like. And that's I Neil's challenge to all of us is to make it much more reliable. I think that is an excellent place to finish and great that Vint was making that comment. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Thank you to Vint, Neil and Nigel. I have to say we would have struggled to get you all physically in the same room. We struggled slightly to get you in the same virtual room, but we have been able to have an excellent, if slightly rushed conversation. So thank you very much indeed to you all.